Welcome to Frank's Day Unexplained and to the Algorithms course at the University of Cambridge. At this point in the course, we shift from looking at algorithms to looking at data structures. So in this video, we begin by having a closer look at what's inside the memory of your computer. Today, we open a new chapter called Data Structures. And I have a picture here of a, a historical artifact, which is a uh, computer that was made in Cambridge in the early 1980s. And this computer had an amazing uh, 16K kilobytes, that is, or 48K of RAM from only 125 pounds. Uh, and well, nowadays, the computer made in Cambridge that uh, you should be thinking of is the Raspberry Pi, which has how much more than 16K of RAM? Does anybody have? No? I think it's four gigabytes, the latest version. Four gigabytes of RAM from only 125. Uh, considering that inflation should multiply this cost by a factor of three or four, uh, a Raspberry Pi uh, costs quite a bit less than that, even without taking inflation into account. So you see how uh, much of a better deal you're getting than those of us who started with computers like that. So if you opened up this type of computer, you would see stuff like this. Um, and so you have things like uh, I can't read the label on this, but I think this is the microprocessor. Uh, and these things are RAM. And they were doing it on the chip, so they were buying faulty RAM uh, and only using the part that worked of the faulty chip of RAM. That's another story. I, I should uh, try not to digress too much, otherwise I'll never get to the point I want to make. Um, this computer came with a manual. This manual was a classic. Uh, and it contained gems such as this, which is uh, totally relevant to our course today. Uh, let's see if I can bring this here. OK. The memory. I'm talking about this stuff over here. Deep inside the computer, everything is stored as bytes, i.e. numbers between 0 and 255. You may think you have stored away the price of wool or the address of your fertilizer suppliers, as people do, but it has all been converted into collections of bytes, and bytes are what the computer sees. Each place where a byte can be stored has an address, which is a number between 0 and FFFF in hex. So an address can be stored as two bytes. OK, that's the first byte and the second byte. So you might think of the memory as a long row of numbered boxes, each of which can contain a byte. Still true today. Still true even if you have the four gigabytes of your Raspberry Pi. Not all the boxes are the same, however. In the standard 16K RAM machine, the boxes from 8000 hex to FFFF hex uh, which is, which is what the top 32k, the top half of the address space, are simply missing altogether. That's these uh, chips here. They were on sockets, and if you hadn't paid the extra, however much it was, they wouldn't be filled in with RAM chips. They would just be empty. Um, the boxes from 4000 hex to 7FFF hex are RAM boxes, which means you can open the lid and alter the contents. And those in this other address range are ROM boxes, which have glass tops but cannot be opened. You just have to read whatever was put in them when the computer was made. So the ROM and the RAM were mapped into the same address space of this uh, Z80 microprocessor, which only has real mode, doesn't have protective mode or any of the clever stuff uh, you have in the processors that you use today. And in this linear address space, addressed with 16 bits and therefore 
uh, maximum of 64k uh, cells. The first 16k had been mapped to the ROM. Uh, I have a suspicion that the ROM was this <coughs> chip over here that I have to recheck. Uh, the part in the middle here was mapped to these chips, which were the RAM. Uh, this part was mapped to more RAM over here. So this was this RAM and this was this other RAM. Uh, you can decide where an address in your address space goes. It doesn't all have to go in the same chip or anything. I mean, you, you can decide from the way you arrange the computer where this stuff goes. Okay, but from the viewpoint we take, what we see is basically just one big array with indices from 0 to 64K, and in each of the cells of the array, there is a byte. And a byte, what is a byte? A byte is 8 bits. And what does it mean? It is something that we have to decide for ourselves. So the same byte, the same value, the same configuration of 8 bits could mean many different things. For example, it could mean a number between 0 and 255. But for example, it could also mean something else. Uh, it could mean a character, uh, because I assign a code to each character. It could also mean an instruction for the processor because each instruction has an opcode. Uh, it could also mean a part of a graphic. It could also mean a, a sound sample. Well, this computer was too primitive to sample sounds, but you could still store a sound sample in there, even if it had been processed somewhere else. Um, you could store uh, anything you like in a byte, so long as it fits. And if it doesn't fit, you can use several bytes uh, for whatever you want. But the point I'm making is that you are the one who assigns meaning to those bits. Uh, they don't have any meaning uh, by themselves. If you were to dump the stuff that was in here in the ROM, you would just get a sequence of 16K bytes. And if you were to uh, open it, if I open it in Emacs, I see this, which looks like a lot of junk. Uh, it looks like a lot of junk, and Emacs shows me escape codes for these things, uh, for these codes over here. And some of them are actually printable, so I can see some pieces of words in here. There's a reason why it's just pieces and not whole words, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, and all this stuff was in the ROM. I may take another view. Hello? OK, um, if I take another view, which is a hex dump view of the same, starting at memory position 0, then uh, this is just indexing. It's not content. The content starts here. And I have this F3, AF11, FF, FF, C3. They don't seem to have any rhyme or reason to them. Any clue what m people might have stored in here? What was in the ROM in that position? Why is there all this garbage? Uh, at position zero, position zero, at least for Z80, was what the computer, what the microprocessor would execute when you turn it on. Don't know what to do. Turn, you get turned on. All right, OK, let me start executing code at address zero. So this was the code that was executed when the computer started. And so I should be looking it. Uh, not this way, not this way, but this other way, which is as a disassembled Z80 bunch of codes. And then the, the same bytes that I've been seeing in, in various guises, so F3, AF, 11, FF. F3, F3 means uh, disable interrupts. AF means XOR register A uh, accumulator with itself. And these other things mean this other opcode and blah, blah. So this is a sequence of machine code instructions. That's what these bytes meant. And you know, F3 could be a number. Well, it is a number. It's also an opcode. And in this case, it will work 
as an opcode, and so on. And, so, and, and these other things in here, uh, you can see that the, this assembly of this stuff here, um, well, it, it goes on. It's, it's in another page. So anyway, I'm not going to make that point because we can't see. And this other thing here is instead a view from a book, a printed book you could buy in the bookstores, uh, where someone has uh, done this operation of disassembling the ROM and writing it out. So you see disable interrupts is the same as here. XOR A is the same as here. Load D is, is the same as here. And has explained, oh, this is what this program does. It commented this assembly of the whole ROM, of the whole computer, uh, as a book, so that you could actually figure out uh, what was in there and what was happening. So, in the course of uh, foundations of computer science, you've been exposed to a particular viewpoint uh, from which um, things are seen in an abstract and prepackaged way. In the, um, for example, you've been exposed to linked lists. Some of you I understand from supervising, some of you supervise uh, about 10% of the people taking this course. Um, some of you had never seen linked lists other than uh, in the foundations course. So linked lists, uh, as presented to you in the foundations course, are a rather abstract view of the linked list that the computer sees. Now in this course, because we are looking at um, the fundamentals out of which things get built, we need to go a little uh, deeper and at a lower level than uh, what you have seen at a high level in foundations. And so at the lowest level, all you have is bytes to work with, and you have to give them meaning. So the, the things that the machine understands are very basic, just things like integers, um, booleans. The machine may have special hardware. Nowadays, all machines do, but at the time, in this one, the Z80 didn't have it. Um, uh, hardware for doing floating point computations. In this case, the machine will have an understanding about a floating point, which would be a collection of bytes, because in one byte you, there's not enough space to store any sensible floating point number. But the machine will understand a group of bytes as a floating point number on which it can do uh, arithmetic primitives in hardware. But besides that, there is not very much else that uh, the microprocessor understands. So anything else? is something that is made on top of these basic building blocks by you or by your compiler. Uh, and all the structure that you add is by uh, using these primitives in some conventional way. So the most fundamental composites that, you've, of course, you've already seen, because you couldn't write any sensible program without using them, uh, would be uh, arrays, records, and pointers. So an array is, well, we've seen the whole memory as an array. An array is a collection of cells that all have the same structure. It's a repetition of the same uh, base unit of the cell. It doesn't have to be an array of bytes. It can be an array of things bigger than a byte, but however big they are, then uh, they are all the same. A record, instead, is an aggregation of things that don't necessarily have to have the same size or structure. So a record like this could be made of this, 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 and this. And this could be, I don't know, uh, I'm just making things up that don't make a lot of sense, but you know, you could have your name, you could have your surname, you could have your gender, you could have your date of birth, and other stuff like that. And you put them all together, and that is a record, a collection of unrelated fields, which could be of different types. And you could imagine having an array of records, for the sake of argument, where each one of these is one of those, and it's replicated in each of the cells. You could have a record of arrays where this one, for example, your surname, is made of an array of characters. 
and so on and so forth. Uh, and then pointers. Pointers are um, another building block for making more complex things. And pointers, I will draw them as circles with an arrow going out of the circle somewhere. The arrow pointing somewhere in memory means the pointer really is just an address in memory. So in what we had earlier uh, in the, um, where is the, disassemble this thing, I can't see this one. Okay, so in here, um, things like this. JP is a machine in, can you see that? JP is a machine code instruction for jump. Uh, and so this um, error two is a label, like this one is a label, error one. Is there anything it refers to error one? Error one is a label to give a symbolic name to address 0008. Error two is some other label that's somewhere else. I can't see it over here. It must be on the next page. Uh, and it says a place, it points at somewhere in memory that you should be jumping to. Uh, if we looked at the actual disassembled code in the other sheet I had, you would see bytes that correspond to the, the address of this. Uh, this is another pointer. It doesn't have a symbolic name, but again, it's point to something else in memory. So a pointer is simply an address. It's simply a configuration of bytes. If you have a place in your code that refers to something, the pointer is simply a place to store an address. But it's just bytes. And if, if the bytes refer to something that doesn't even exist, so we had, um, we had the memory map of the spectrum here with some parts that in the 16K machine didn't even exist. You didn't even have a chip uh, of RAM in there. And you can still have a pointer having an address in here, in the middle of this space. Nobody prevents you from doing that. Of course, if you then try to access it, then things will not work because there isn't any RAM in there. So pointers are very versatile and very flexible, lets you do many things, and a number of these things result in spectacular crashes. And this is why uh, higher level languages try to prevent you from using the full power of pointers because uh, you can easily shoot yourself in the foot uh, with a very big bazooka if you're using pointers uh, in a free uh, and careless way. And so uh, both Java, which lets you kind of see pointers, but only if you use them in a certain way, uh, and ML, which doesn't let you see pointers at all, uh, try to shield you from the bad things that could happen to you. But what the processor sees is basically just the pointers, and all the other things, all the other clever and useful things you do have to be built by someone, the guy who writes the compiler typically, uh, out of these pointers. So it is worth understanding at some level, I mean, at some point, someone will have to understand how to deal uh, with those pointers properly. So we are going to make use of diagrams uh, which have records and pointers, such as, um, I have a record that contains various fields, and among them is also uh, some pointers, and these pointers may point to, for example, other records. Now, in this drawing, I'm still at some abstract way where I'm not really showing where these things are in memory, but this means this structure could be allocated anywhere in the memory, and this other structure this first one could be here, and the second one could be over there, and the pointer in here of this one will point to this one over here. 
And the fact that these pointers uh, are there allows me to allocate these things anywhere in memory without having to have them in sequence one after the other. 